How's it going, dear viewers? Your gracious host, King Walker, has returned, and I am here to acclimate you to the upcoming lecture. Today, we will be joined once again by romance and urban fantasy author Mrs. Carol Brown as she gives you a comprehensive course on developmental editing. If you would like to join us in improving your writing craft, you may click the link in the description to be invited to our Writing Club Discord server. We will not only gain insight into the craft, but also access to more lectures like these from other instructors. And now, without further ado, I present. If you guys have not already clicked on it, I already have the slides up here, so you should be able to watch the stream that way. Go ahead and do that at your leisure. If you guys are not aware, hello, my name is Carol Brown. I write books and I edit books for other people. My specialty when it comes to genres is going to be romance, urban fantasy, superhero, and sci-fi. Um, when you work with editors, this is a pro tip for me to you, find out what they specialize in because whatever genre that they're very good at is going to be the one that they know very well and the one that they can edit very well. So for example, if you came to me and you said, hey, I want to go and have you edit my weird fiction, I would say, that's not my specialty, but I can go and brush up on that for you so that way I can make sure that I understand the genre well enough to talk to you about it, right? So uh, if you guys ever work with an editor, just go ahead and ask them that question. Along with my beautiful portrait that was done by Igor, those are books that I have published, not telling you to buy them, but I'm just trying to demonstrate my credibility for what it is that I know and say and do. One of the things I used to do when I was a teacher is I used to do what was referred to as housekeeping. And so that would kind of set the precedent of uh, how my presentations would go and all that fun stuff. So what we're going to do that's a little different from last time is I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to do the presentation first because I will likely answer some of the questions that you guys are having during the, well, the presentation. Sorry, I have word redundancy today. I couldn't self-edit quite well. Um, but if you do have a question, what I would like you to do is just to leave them in the Discord chat that you guys have been using very effectively, thank you very much, um, to help me find those questions a little bit more, to help the facilitator find them a little bit more. If you could just put Q in front of the question and then answer the question, then when we get done with the presentation, we'll circle back and go through those. And if they have been answered, we'll skip them. Not because your question is not valuable, but because we've already addressed it. So, um, and then when we do bring you up for the question, um, we will actually bring you up here with the rest of us in case you want to elaborate on that question a little bit, and you are more than welcome to. So, that is my housekeeping. Thank you for listening to me. The objective of today is that I actually want to give you guys an introduction to developmental editing. Um, we're going to go over what to focus on when you do do developmental editing, and I'm going to give you guys some resources that you can add to your toolkit or personal library, depending on how you like to do that. A fun phrase for me to everybody else is that everybody needs an editor, especially the people with English degrees. Now, the reason I say this is because if I had a penny for every time I told somebody you might want to get an editor to look at that, and the response was, I don't need an editor, I'm an English major, I would be able to afford a very expensive house right now. And I'm going to go ahead and tell you, those wonderful, enlightful people still need an editor. One thing that I do want to discuss with you is the, actually the types of editing because I know that when authors first branch out into uh, both the writing career and then moving into the editing field, um, there's a little bit of confusion about editing itself. When you hear get an editor, uh, everybody just thinks of the person with the red pencil that goes through your manuscript and circles every time that you keep overusing the word Friday or you don't use commas correctly and stuff like that. You are mostly correct, but there are several different kinds of editors um, and editing processes. When you, if you, I should say it this way, if you happen to go through a traditional publisher, um, they do what's referred to as an in-house edit. And the in-house edit is uh, kind of interesting because, you know, I'll save that for the end. I don't want to get too off topic. But for your guys' sake and your information, there are four main types of editing. So the developmental edit, which is the one with the arrow there, is the story, the world, and the characters. This is the big picture stuff that you want your readers to be immersed in. And a developmental editor is going to be able to focus on that, tell you if your story makes sense, isn't consistent, talk about characters, all that fun stuff. The line editor is the editor that everybody tends to think about. Those are the people that look at sentence structure. They focus at flow. Uh, the tone of voice, you know, if things, you know, are kind of consistent, clear, they definitely want to make sure that your writing is very easy to read. That's their big job. Uh, your copy editor, that is going to be your grandma ninja. 
they're going to be the people that always says, you know, if you're using the Oxford comma correctly or not using it, they're going to talk about, you know, consistencies in your stru uh, sentence structure, spelling, grammar, all that stuff they tried to teach us in second grade. And we were like, nah. Uh, now, the last thing is going to be the proofread. Uh, the proofreader is the person that actually goes through the manuscript with a fresh pair of eyes. Now, um, in the editing world, you can actually technically use the same editor for those first three, but they always recommend that you use somebody for the proofread because they are not as immersed into your manuscript as you are. Um, one final edit that I will actually give an honorable mention for, but I did not put it on there because I have mixed feelings about this type of editing, is called the sensitivity reader. Um, and the reason I say that with a, a loaded breath is because um, when the sensitivity reader was initially brought up to me, it was the type of person who said, you can't write that because it's not appropriate, right? Um, now it's, and the reason I have like a weird back and forth with that is because whoever is doing your developmental edit should be well-rounded and educated enough to be able to point out if there is something of that offensive nature that needs to be brought to your attention as the uh, as the writer, right? But um, as time continues to progress, there's like this kind of fad of having um, as, of having the sensitivity reader. So uh, you could embed that into your process if that's something that you want, or you could uh, talk to whoever your developmental editor is and basically say. Um, I've got this thing in here about uh, a, this kind of character, but I don't know if I'm depicting it correctly. So you can do stuff like that. So you could add that other one in there. You could not. It's really up to you. When we're talking about developmental editing, if you guys remember, I said we're looking at dialogue, we're looking at characters, we're looking at your world stuff, right? So if I had to give you books about any of those, it would be these three books that you have up here. Um, How to Write Dazzling Dialogue by James Scott Bell is probably the only dialogue book that I would ever recommend to anybody. Not only does this book talk about ways to craft dialogue that is both engaging, sharp, and just really on point, but he goes over a lot of the nuances about dialogue, such as dialogue grammar. And uh, a lot of individuals when they first write dialogue don't know dialogue grammar very well. And they, 99% every time I go through a manuscript, it's it's off. Um, and so this is always a book I would recommend. That book is also only 99 pages long. So if you're worried it's a thick book, fear not. It is uh, bite size, as I like to call it. Now, Fiction Formula is written by Deborah Chester, and um, the thing that really sells me about the fact that she's very knowledgeable about, about what she says and what she does is she's actually um, one of the people that Jim Butcher uh, learned his craft from. So if you guys are not aware about Jim Butcher, he's a very famous urban fantasy, contemporary fantasy author who writes The Dresden Files. And he's got a foreword in here where he basically talks about, like, please listen to her. She taught me what I know. So if it's good enough for, you know, a six-figure author, it might be good enough for you. But I have read this book. It really goes over uh, a lot of the stuff that has to do with writing fantasy, tropes within fantasy, uh, story, structure, all that stuff. It covers all of it. That book, definitely meaty. Uh, I would not be able to finish it in a day, but very good. And then... If you guys were here for the last time I did a presentation um, where we were talking about romance and how to add romance to your writing, I also recommended creating character arcs. Um, again, uh, K.M. Wielder really knocks this book out of the park in terms of uh, the different kinds of character arcs, uh, the examples that she does, and the ways to kind of troubleshoot if you're working through it. So not paid, not sponsored, wish I was. I would love to meet these people at a panel. Probably not going to happen. So let's move on. With developmental editing, this is your big picture stuff. Again, we're looking at your plot, characters, dialogue, pacing, world building, and I've got other on the bottom there. When we're talking about your plot, there's, and again, we'll dive into this in a, in a few more uh, slides in, in a lot more detail than what I have right here. But the reason that the developmental edit process kind of focuses on this is because if any of those things that you see on this graph are off, it breaks your entire story. It really does. If you've got great plot but flat characters, everybody's just going to talk about how flat your characters are. If you've got great characters and flat plot, people are going to wonder what these characters are doing or they're not going to feel like they're endangered or anything else like that. Pacing, um, when we're talking about that, we're kind of talking about, you know, how fast these scenes are going or what happens uh, or how we got from one scene to another. World building 
honestly needs its own presentation, but with world building, we're looking at your setting, we're looking at your culture, your magic system, like all, all that fun stuff that people like to spend 10 years building. And if you spend 10 years building your world, you've spent nine years too long. Um, and again, that is a different presentation that I can give at a different day if you guys are interested. But yeah, so if any of these things are kind of off, then again, it's going to have like a ripple effect throughout the rest of your book. And if there's one thing readers like to pick at, it's what's wrong with your book. So let's not give them any easy hooks for that. We'll talk about the big plot energy part. So this is your external plot, your internal plot, and the big things that I usually have to ask myself when I go through manuscripts, which is how does plot affect your characters, your setting? Um, now your external plot, that's the physical threat. Like if we don't do this, the world ends, right? Um, so what is the physical plot? What are the politics that are involved with that? What are the things that are at risk? And the internal plot, that's usually your your interpersonal items. You know, do I get the girl? Do I make up with my dad? You know, what is what is the character arc in that situation? And I'm not going to say that your character always needs to change from the start of the book to the end of the book, but people, when they read books, they do like to see um, development and struggle. And if you think about some, well, actually, if you guys can take a moment while I'm talking and just write about characters from fiction that really stand out to you, um, when you do that, can you tell me how they changed from the start of uh, their story platform to the end of it, so to speak? So if you want to pick a comic book character, you can talk about that or a book character or, or cartoon or anything like that. That's an informal question for me, too. But... Yeah, people really do like interpersonal plots, and that that's kind of what creates like the immersive experience for the most part. Now, this third bullet point of how does your plot affect characters and setting? So, for example, if your plot, if not intervened by the character, does your plot actually change, or is your plot woven into the character, so to speak? Right. Um, and if the answer is that both are very independent, then I'm I'm going to ask you questions about your plot, like how are they how are they tied together? What brings them together at some point? Um, and then also about how does your plot affect the setting? So one of my fun questions about you know how does the plot affect the setting? Um, Brandon Sanderson, one of my favorite authors to use, he actually wrote uh, a book series, and one of the the first ones was uh, was called Steel Heart, and that plot definitely directed or definitely affected the the setting because it was like these very superpower individuals that basically got to control certain territories right and so if they weren't able to do anything with these superheroes like you know it, it always would affect like the immediate city area and the people that were living so like the threat was real right you could not ignore it now a fun question that i like to ask folks is what is the cost of the plot if it gets completed or resolved and what is the cost of the plot if it doesn't right so if you have like some kind of raging warlord and you have to stop him right what is the cost if you do stop him does that prevent war with another nation um does that prevent like the end of the the world so to speak or if you don't stop him what's the consequence of that like does he take over other play places or does he end up saving the world Gurren Lagann, uh, one of my favorite animes, actually has uh, an early protagonist, and it's very interesting to see uh, kind of the side effects of what happens when you topple that individual and how it affects the world. So that's one of my favorite favorite things I like to do. Uh, Keratos. Oh, that's a good one, too. I really like that one from the video. Is that, no, that's not from the video game. Tired veteran. Yes, it, yes, it is. <clears throat> it's from the video game. Kratos. Next on that bracket is going to be characters. So kind of like what I talked about a little bit with the romance stuff. When I'm looking at your characters, especially as your developmental editor, I'm going to be asking questions like, what is your character agency? What is their motive? And what's the cost of, you know, what is, what is the cost of what they get or when they don't get it? So um, if you guys could do me a favor and also kind of answer this question in the chat for me, that would be really good for you as well. So in your current work in progress, your main character, when we're talking about the agency, Think about what they want and what is the cost of getting what they want. If you guys can take a moment in the chat at this point to uh, tell me about your character agency and your current work in progress. So what I'm asking for is what is it that they're trying to get and what will it cost them to get it, right? So nobody gets something for nothing, right? Uh, Rick and Morty actually does a really phenomenal example of Rick or Morty wanting something. Halfway through it, they get what they want, but it comes at a price, right? So what is that price for your character? 
uh, why you guys do that. And again, I'm talking about kind of me when I'm looking at your characters and stories. I'm going to be looking for characteristics or unique qualities. What is it about this character that sets them apart? Is it a physical trait? Is it a personality quirk? Like, what is it that when they come onto the page, I know exactly who they are? Uh, and then again, you know, as kind of mentioned, is how does your character change from the start of the story to the end of the story? Uh, a fun thing that people like to talk about with characters are flaws and complexities. And I said that very slowly because how do I want to word this? A lot of individuals, when they initially write characters, they have like this very high ideal of what they want their character to be. And when you ask them about when, what their flaw should be, there's a couple of the different answers that you'll get with that. Um, my favorite flaw that I really hate to, to see sent to my way is, uh, well, my character's too nice. That's not a flaw. Don't do that. Um, but if you want to talk about how they're a flaw in the sense that they're a doormat and people walk all over them, that's fine. You know, basically you're saying that they're kind of like a social submissive that way or they have uh, confrontation uh, problems. That's fine. Uh, but, you know, when you when you give people flaws, like give them like an actual flaw, um, you know, so some characteristics and flaws that I have as an individual, and I'll go ahead and share them with you, is uh, I'm a nail biter. And I bite my nails when I'm very nervous, right? And I also know that when I get really nervous or when I get really stressed, I'm suddenly going to think about what's in my liquor cabinet, right? Because that's my coping mechanism for dealing with stress. Not healthy, but also relatable, right? So uh, think about th stuff like that when you're talking about adding layers to your characters and what makes them more real. Uh, so this, uh, this other bullet point that I have here about relationship with other characters, obviously you don't have just one character in here, right? Um, I, I'm going to pick on you, Venom, because you're an easy target for me right now. Venom actually has a, a story with, uh, two brothers in it, and I'm always asking him about these two brothers, right? Like, they're, they're my favorite, like, to, to both have on the page, but also see them engage with each other, Right. Because they're either uh, they're either kind of fighting each other, or they're about to like you know get in, or they're they're kind of agreeing, but like aggressively agreeing, so to speak. And it's really fun to see on the page. But there's obviously other characters that are in this world too. So when these characters come in, one of the first things I want to know is how do these two brothers know these other characters in the script? Right. I have lots of questions um, that always make me want to read more. And that's a great way that you can flesh out your world, by the way, by basically kind of exploring the relationships that your main character or characters have with the other characters that are there. Um, and then we talked about how are they human relatable, um, you know, kind of like when we're talking about with the flaws and com complexities, you know, what is it that makes your character somebody uh, that, you know, your readers kind of are like want to root for them, so to speak. And in film and in books right now, there's going to be a beat there, and it's referred to as Save the Cat. And Save the Cat is this thing that basically, I like to say the word basically, this is my redundant word for the day. Um, but it's, it's this act that makes the main character somebody that seems like a good person, right? And it's referred to as Save the Cat because you're either saving a cat from a tree or you're getting a kid out from in front of a rushing car or, you know, pick, pick your thing. I wrote an urban fantasy story and my save the cat moment in that particular story, which isn't published yet, was this rat shaman and she came across a rat and the rat said, I'm about to die and all I want to do is feel the sun on my fur again. And so she picked up the rat and she took the rat back outside so he could be in the fresh air kind of thing. That's considered, uh, you know, a save the cat moment. So whatever that would be for your character, go ahead and like kind of take a moment to, to reflect on that. And I'm going to keep going. Okay, dialogue. I, I won't lie. Like, I probably go really ham on dialogue when I see it. When I go, when I look for dialogue outside of your formatting, I want to hear voices, right? And I don't want all voices to sound the same. And if they start to sound the same, I'm going to point it out. I'm going to point it out real quick. But uh, everybody obviously doesn't speak the same. Venom and I do not speak identical whatsoever. We all different ha we both have different vernaculars and different enunciations and kind of different ways that we express a common idea. Uh, one thing that I tend to have to harp on a lot is who is speaking at this time. Now, if you have two people in a room, right, you can kind of get away with establishing who the first and second speaker is, and then you can kind of let it flow after that. But when you have three people in the room or three plus people in the room, then you have to start adding speech tags and body language and, and all that kind of fun stuff to, to make clear who is speaking in that moment. And if you can get away with kind of using body language um, to describe the tone of that person, I would really encourage you to do that because it's both kind of um, 
depicting their characterizations and their mentality without you having to tell the reader. And if there's one thing lots of people like to say, it's show, don't tell. Uh, now, meaningful conversations. Now, there are two kinds of conversations I run across, and there are the conversations that the author is having because they need to have them for the scene to make sense, and then there's the conversations for the reader, right? Um, now, I'll come in and basically highlight stuff and say, take this out. This was just for you. Uh, but uh, a lot of safe language that people like to start with, they're kind of like, hi, how are you? How is the weather today? Right? Because that's our social pleasantries, right? You don't have to do that in book writing. Nobody's here to, to do that. Um, what you can do in some places, you can kind of skim over it and say something along the lines of like, after they exchange pleasantries, so-and-so said, you know, stuff like that. Conflict and dialogue. So when I talked earlier about the, um, how to write dazzling dialogue, Scott Bell actually phrased it perfectly, where when you write dialogue between two characters, you need to treat it like a fencing match. So it's these two characters wanting something from each other. They're trying to get it, but they're trying to get it with words, right? So when you guys are looking at your dialogue or anything else like that, what is the conflict in your dialogue? What are these two characters trying to get away from each other? My favorite example of really fantastic dialogue is actually going to be from um, the book series called Expanse. Uh, the Thyeth and Wakes is the first book in that if you want to do that. But outside of the redundant speech tags, the dialogue in that book is freaking amazing. And if you guys um, haven't seen it or read it or anything else like that, I'm going to give you a spoiler and tell you that Amos is my favorite character because he has the best dialogue in that book. He's so good. Um, now, I'm going to be mean to one of the, the classic animes when I say this, but when you guys are using your dialogue, don't use it as an exposition dump um, to kind of feed your story uh, to the reader. And some people will do that because the, there's been some writing advice where folks are saying, you know, if you're not sure how to convey it to the reader, then use your, your reader and get, or your character dialogue to help hammer that in. And there's both good ways and bad ways to do that. Um, and the good way to do that, I would actually say, is um, usually depicted by Jim Butcher, a favorite author, not friend, but, you know, maybe one day I'll shake his hand. Um, but Jim Butcher's dialogue is really good at doing world building without making it an exposition dump whatsoever. So if you guys are looking for a case study in that, I would recommend book one. Uh, it's called Stormfront, and it's so good. I absolutely master class on how to write your first book. But in terms of how to use exposition, or rather how to use uh, your dialogue as an exposition dump, Gundam Wing the 1995 anime is really good at constantly using their dialogue as an exposition dump for like everything. And I say that with absolute certainty because I am watching it right now and it's killing me inside one episode at a time. Uh, pacing. So again, how fast are your scenes going? Um, and how long does your story take? Does your story take over the course of two days, two weeks, two months, years? And if it's taking a long time, how are you showing that pacing, right? How are you showing the pacing in terms of like season change or how people change clothes or little fun things like that? Uh, and then does the pacing make sense for the story? I, I kind of poked fun a little bit of Wheel of Time because the pacing that story for me, and again, it's an objective point of view, so not everybody agrees, but that story pacing is just so long. And it's usually like a chapter talking about like how two guys crossed a farm or field to sleep in the barn kind of situation. So if it's not serving kind of like the greater purpose of the story, um, ask yourself if what you're writing in terms of the pacing is serving a greater purpose later on in the plot, or if you're doing that just for the sake of showing that you know how to describe a farmer field. Um, now, pacing, as you guys have seen written here, is a writing element that you have to master as the writer so your reader doesn't pick up on it. Maya Angelou said it really well when she said that easy reading is damn hard writing. So pacing is one of those things that if your reader picks up on it, um, probably not a good thing. Half the time they won't pick up on it until the very end after they've finished your book. But if they pick up on it right away, bad news bears. So we want to keep them engaged. We want to keep them reading. We want to make sure that they're having a good time. World building, again, as I kind of mentioned, it could really be its own presentation. There's so much that goes into it. When we're talking about social or social economics or anything else like that, we're talking about at the micro and the macro level. So, um, you know, how are civilizations kind of in villages and nations? How are they in families, individuals, friends, stuff like that? 
what are their what are their customs their cultures how do they make money how do they create goods what is their way of life how do they do trade um and then how do, when you have two different cultures that meet together how do they be able to do trade is there like a universal way that they have to do some kind of item bargain you know all that kind of stuff and maybe that might not make sense for your world maybe you are writing a contemporary romance right where it's set in modern day there's a lot of forgiveness there because you've uh, you know everybody lives in modern day we all know that we use currency right now to buy things so you don't have to worry about that so much so when you're talking about like the social and the cultural stuff you'll be talking more about that on the character level so to speak uh, economics, I find, is a usually very neglected, um, a neglected element when it comes to fantasy because everybody likes to say that something's ten gold and then they move on, right? But what if you had a story about, you know, the economics of your world, and at some point the forgery was brought in, right? And so with forgery, then you're talking about inflation because now there's suddenly a surge in silver pieces that weren't there before, and now people are only accepting copper and gold. Well, not everybody has copper and gold. Little, little tiny things like that that you could play with. Magic system, uh, whew, yeah, magic system. So you got two kinds of magic systems, giving you all a crash course here. You got the soft magic system that you don't really explain, but magic's there and somehow it solves things and you say, thank you, ma'am, and you move on. Or you got the hard magic system with uh, strong guidelines and limitations that your reader is aware of. And when you're working with a hard magic system, the limitations of that magic system is actually tied to your plot and your plot solution. So that's my my thing that I'll tell uh, to you. Politics, kind of the same thing with everything else. How does the politics of your world kind of affect your story? Um, and I don't mean that in the government sense. You can kind of bring that down a little bit further um, with uh, kind of almost the business sense. There was a book I read, and I, I think I referenced it in the last lecture that I gave you guys, and it was the pages between, and the politics that was actually in that book was between um, was between realtors and kind of what was going on there. Maybe we can call it a little bit more office politics, but or the office competition. But that was a factor, and that that kind of counts for that. Um, and then again, the question that I always ask myself is, how's your world building tied into your plot? And if it's not tied into your plot, one of the things that I will encourage you to do as a developmental editor is please weave it into your plot. Find a way to have it make your character's life way more difficult than it is right now. That's always a lot of fun for me. Other, um, I'm going to pick on Venom again because he's an easy target. Um, but other is like little tiny things that might kind of reach out or kind of grab your attention at the time. This is like your extreme nitpicking stuff. So the thing I'm going to pick on Venom about is that Venom has a horse in his story. And I kept forgetting it was a horse. Um, and the reason I kept forgetting it was a horse was because it had a very human name. And I kept forgetting it was in the scene because it would be like, you know, rode in on horse name, and then I wouldn't see the horse again after that. Yeah, so the horse's name was Sheila. <laughs> and so when I first read the name Sheila, I was like, where the fuck is Sheila? And so I spent, like, the page going back and forth trying to find Sheila, come to find out Sheila had been mentioned on, like, page 19. I was like, I'm so confused, right? So it's little tiny things like that. Um, now, one thing I will say when you guys are doing your own developmental edit is if something feels off, then uh, it probably is off. And you're more than welcome to go ask your critique partner to take a look at it and get a second opinion. And um, one thing I will throw out real, real quick um, is that you will have uh, fun things in authorhood. It's called a beta reader, alpha reader, critique partner, and an editor. And these are all people at some point who are going to read your manuscript and they're going to give you thoughts and opinions on it. A critique partner is somebody else who's also an avid writer um, if they're not already a published author and they understand writing craft as well as you do. And their goal is to kind of look at the behind the scenes, the, the lower part of the iceberg of the story with you and kind of help you with that part. An editor is going to be looking at it from both ends of view, but they're going to be making sure that it makes sense for the reader. And then an alpha reader is pretty much like a friend where you're like, can you please read this and tell me if it makes sense kind of thing. And a beta reader will be uh, a group of individuals, hopefully, if you're that lucky. Uh, usually for me, it's like two people. But a beta reader is somebody who is an avid reader. They don't really know a lot about writing craft other than if they like a book or don't like a book. And so they'll read your stuff and tell you if they like it or something that they might want to see more of that you might be able to add in. So. I was, uh, you know, I failed you all. I was going to give you guys a picture of a manuscript that I had edited recently. 
Um, and I didn't include this picture. So what I will do is uh, over the weekend, I'll actually send the picture in so that way you guys can have the reference. But when I do my own developmental editing um, for a story, I read it, but don't edit it, right? Like that's the big rule. So read it and uh, use three colors. Don't use more than three colors because if you start getting color coded crazy with this bitch, you're going to forget what the heck you're editing. So don't do it. Pick three colors. Do it this way. That's That's the easiest way. Um, but yellow is, I'm not sure about something. I want to come back to it. So it's kind of itching at your brain. You're not sure why you want to come back to it. Just do that real quick. Red is where you're like, I don't know what I was thinking when I wrote this. It is complete trash. I'm going to have to change it. Don't do that to your entire manuscript. I know it might be tempting. Just pick like one or two sentences and do it from there. And then blue is your second opinion, right? Like, so I'm going to go and I'm going to highlight this in blue and I'm going to send it to my friend and say, can you take a look at the blue passages? and tell me if that makes sense or if it works. They'll thank you for the color coding, trust me. Um, and again, I do really want to focus on the do not edit process, especially if you're doing it digitally. If you are, it's so tempting to really just start trying to change things while you're reading it. So it's a, a willpower check not to. And if you feel like you have to add something on there, take notes. Um, I use the comment section very often in my Google notes on things that I wanna research, maybe I gotta go and do some fact checking or go research a documentary on something that I'm trying to do or whatever note that you have to leave. But you can do that on your digital form or you can do that in your paper form, however that works to you. And then when you are creating your own system, kind of like I said, just use the three colors. Whatever your own system is going to be, please keep it simple. Don't uh, don't get carried away. Don't make it its own process because the more arduous that you make this self-editing process, the more, less likely that, that you're going to do it. Or you'll be so convoluted with it that you'll keep living in the revision process for the rest of eternity. And you don't need to do that either. Uh, and I could talk about how long it takes to edit something, but that's really um, kind of on the individual basis. So I won't do that. One thing that sometimes folks ask me is how do I improve the, the skills, right? Like how do I become a better editor, both, you know, developmental or any of those other things? So these are some recommendations that I have for you for developmental editing. Um, the first thing that you need to do is increase your intake of media, right? So the, a lot of really avid readers um, are also people who read so many different books, both magazine, they read books. Uh, I mean, obviously they read books, obviously. Um, they watch movies, they entertain shows, they do radio dramas, whatever. They have a high media intake. And the reason they do that is it kind of fuels their brain for other stuff, but it also really gets them familiar with the media process. When um, when I was actually first working with Venom and Venom told me what Venom genre was, I was like, you know, I've only read like a couple of books about that. And so by the time I actually sat down with Venom, I had finished reading four books of that genre. And the reason I wanted to make sure that I did that was because I wanted to understand Venom genre well enough that when we were talking about it, I knew audience expectation, pacing, and all that kind of other stuff. And I can't do that by looking it up and reading it on a blog. I have to actually, you know, immerse myself in the material. So I would encourage you guys to do that as well. Uh, practice. You guys are already doing that really well. You're in this group. That means that you guys are self-editing and you're having discussions about each other's pieces. Great, great foundational starting point. I would do that. So edit your own work, other, other people's work. And as you continue to do that, it's like the developing, you know, that muscle inside your brain. And the more often you do it, the easier it is to do. For this last thing, this is kind of fun, but you should always be in some form of professional development. You should always be reading, uh, researching, learning, exploring new things, attending panels, whatever. Go immerse yourself in, in other material that even if you're not directly affecting your manuscript right now, it might be able to help you with that. I had a conversation with a comic uh, writer the other day, and he wrote a panel where somebody got backhanded and they started, you know, as soon as the, you know, they got hit, they spit out blood. And I was like, well, it doesn't actually work that way. And so I explained it to him. And their question at the end was like, why do you know that? It's like, oh, well, at some point I read this book called Violence for Writers. And so like, I just kind of remember about how blood wells up in the mouth and how that all looks, right? Um, so always be looking for stuff, watch documentaries, read, you know, read fiction, read science fiction, read nonfiction, read psychology, anything, just always be digesting something. And if you think that you know enough, go read another book. And that's my presentation. Thank you guys so much. So ready, come at me.
honestly, after hearing most of what you said, um, apart from wanting like this entire um, presentation to go over, um, there were a few things I I got from what you said, but I also had a few questions in regards to like it is the editing process for me. Um, so I remember I remember when I had saw the first screen, I started taking pictures of all this stuff just because my brain was like, okay, I gotta follow this one. So where is it? Where is it? Dialogue, pacing, no, no, no. External plot, internal plot. Alright, actually no, it was external plot. So and I use this all the time because Harry Potter is my run too. Like the first book you kinda open it up and I always feel like the first book should carry a certain level of like plot to it and it's mm -hmm. something that leaves it open to interpretation what would that be called internal or external because um i'm sorry more like um i mean like what would that be called as far as like you know like if you're talking about the start of the book okay so that's that's a different i know what you're talking about but in order for me to explain it i have to go on on a side track and then come back to it so when you're talking about the first intro to a book um when you guys are doing that and do I say this concisely? The th first 300 words of your book, of your series, has to depict a couple different things. First off, you have to establish the setting, the plot, the genre, the, the, the theme of the book. Um, and you also have to talk about kind of like this, this external threat, so to speak, right? Now, in Harry Potter, fantastic example. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, don't cancel me, but if you do, please make me millions of dollars. Um, that book started off with a hint of the external threat in the sense that everybody was kind yes. of rejoicing at the death of, you know, of Voldemort, right? But the external threat was still kind of present because we had the Dursleys who were just kind of like something weird is going on and we don't want to be part of it. And that was the introduction of the interpersonal plot, right? So that's Harry and his relatives who are just very normal people. Thank you very much. And they don't do any of this weirdness and they're absolutely, you know, as typical as you could find them, but they're not. Um, and that's, yeah, so that sets up the, the interpersonal conflict between Harry and his family. And then you've got, um, Hagrid that shows up on the bike with, uh, Harry, uh, to speak to, uh, McGonagall and Dumbledore when they're there. I think I just butchered one of those names. I haven't read this book series since it was published. Um, yeah, so, and... You know, and and the thing that's really good about that, that's actually a master class on how to start a series. I'm really glad that you brought that up. Um, is that there's enough there's enough breadcrumbs, as I like to call them, that lead into so much more that's going on, but it's done so naturally. And earlier when I was talking to you guys about dialogue, right? Go check out that dialogue that's in that book because they're saying things, they're kind of telling you stuff, but they're not spilling it for you um, or spoon feeding it as well. And oh, it's so good, man! I'm gonna have to read that again. Look what you've done. Um, yeah. but you, so, uh, but you. On, I, I think... Oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. sorry. What was that, ma'am? No, no. Go on. Go on. Oh, sorry. What was that? I, oh, I, I don't. Apologize. I was trying to. All right. Um. So what I meant was, and I think you did kind of like say it when you mentioned the breadcrumbs thing. It is because um a lot of books, and I, I feel like this is kind of what my main point is. It's like I always feel like, like in comics, because I do do comics as well. It's like, I always tell people, you know, do a pilot of what you want to present for your world so that pretty much people get a hint at what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to, like, Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, or is it Philosopher's Stone, because apparently there's a book called Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. I don't know which one that is. Um, it, it seems like there is usually, like, a rough draft presentation of something or the main goal of something, and it gives you just enough information that you have, like, world-building to like a kind of C plus level extent or B level extent. And it's like everything kind of just wraps itself up nicely mm -hmm. in a way. Like you, you're, it's like, it's like, oh, it ends with Harry getting off the train and not telling the Dursley that he has magic, that, that he can't practice magic at home. But he's like, they don't know that. And it's like, you know, oh, what fun will Harry have with this? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's like, it's like, it's like, we don't get a hint at book two. We just get a hint that it's over right now that Harry's mm -hmm. journey is done, so to speak, even though it's not done. But we get this hint that it's, quote, done. Because it's like I'm the done. first book is like, I guess you could say the first book is kind of like the, like, I don't want to say like 
the one and done, but it's kind of like the one and done. I, I don't want to take up any more time, but my last example is kind of like, um, what's his name? Like, um, like the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Like, mm-hmm. if you didn't know about The Magician's Nephew, you would assume that The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe is, like, the first book. And even when you read it, though, it's like, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, it just, like, it begins, and then it ends. And it's like, it's like the kids live their life in another world, they come back home, and their adventures mm-hmm. are over with in Narnia. And that's about it. And it's like, you never, you don't think that there's going to be another book, because if you don't know C.S. Lewis, you don't know that the dude did a book before that called The Magician's Nephew. But mm-hmm. then you're not really aware that, oh, snap, there was a book before this. But I, I guess my main point, though, is, like, it's, like, when it comes to books, like, you know, first-time books, like, are there, are there, like, should you put, is, like, can't, is there, like, a limit on what you should have or what you should add or what you should, like, keep away? Like, should you make it, like, 70% of your full intention so you don't try to feel like you're rushing too much into it? Okay. No, I can answer that question. Uh, there's actually two answers that I want to give you because you addressed a really good point. Uh, a lot of times when you have the first book in a series, um, your publisher and your editor and your agent are going to tell you to write it as if it's going to be the only book in the series. And the reason that they do that is because if the sales for your book with the traditional publishing group isn't very high, they don't want to invest. Um, now, this is a little different from five or six years ago where they were always looking for series because they were looking for cash cows. That's not a nice way to put it. But the golden rule is that whenever you read the first book in a series, tidy it up enough at the end so it can stand on its own. And, you know, go pick any, pick whatever book you would like to in any book series and kind of ask yourself, like, if no more books came after this, was this a solid enough ending? And I want to say 90% of the time, the answer to that is going to be yes. And that's on purpose. Um, now, in regards to how long your book should be, there's a couple of different factors that go into that. Um, one is the genre of your book. Uh, epic high fantasy books will usually be anywhere between the word span of 110,000 to 200,000 words. Um, if you are writing something, uh, you know, kind of like YA related, then they usually like to have that sweet spot at about 70K. Uh, and so, yeah, so... You're looking at genre, world building, setting, how big is your plot, and all that kind of stuff. So those are those are things that you have to kind of weigh in when you're trying to answer that question. Um, now, if you're asking me as your developmental editor, I'm going to tell you, write that story as long as you feel it needs to be. And when I go through it, I will have a very real conversation with you about how to cut it. Venom is here. He's very well aware of, like, why is this here? You have another question whenever you're um, done answering his. I'm good. I'm good. I'm out. Okay. Oh, you're out? I got, well, you... I got from that. Okay. You got to come back, though, because I like you. I like all of you so far. Gracias. Uh, okay. So the question. Um, okay. So in the story, I write, the MCs are facing a demon invasion, but they don't have a way of dealing with it. So they start with only trying to survive in it establish a way to end it later is there a danger of feeling directionless um no i mean it really kind of depends on how you set that up if you are i think okay so i did a i did a book review with one of my friends and it was for one of my favorite books called sabriel and i'll spoil that a little bit but he said that up until chapter three he never felt like that character was in danger because she was the only character there and if obviously she died right the story ended but he still had like a whole bunch of the book in his hand so that wasn't going to be the thing um so when you're writing about danger from demons and stuff like that i would um i would encourage you to kind of explore how you depict those sensations what that feels like to be hunted down or having to survive And what I mean by sensations, like, you know, what does the human body go through when it's afraid, when it's fighting for its life, things like that. Um, You know, in Star Trek, there's a, a, there's a term, it's called a red shirt. It's usually the guy that dies at some point in the episode. Typically, it's the guy in a red shirt, right? Um, And they did that because they wanted to show the danger of the moment without actually hurting the main cast at that point. So if you happen to have somebody that might be a red shirt that you want to use to kind of showcase the danger that is that's happening in your story you can do that and there's masterful ways to do that um 
But I will say, if you make it really clear, everybody is going to know that that character's got death flags on them, and they'll call it out like it is, so. Hope I answered your question. I kind of added something in the... I added something in the comment section to you for him. Mm -hmm. his, uh, question. Uh, impending doom can be compelling, but you have to work to make it. Yeah, easy reading, damn hard writing. Um, and then there has to be the imminent danger as well. Oh, what's a really good book that actually did that for me? Um, you know, actually, it was one of your friends that said, that made that kind of dystopia book he or they I, I don't really know they did a really good job of setting that story up uh, to be in a world of danger serious. like that was yeah. oh was it oh it was so good i really like it um i'm trying to think of another book you know what i'm gonna do i'm about to pull out my kindle guys <laughs> let me Oh, mm -mm. he says they're okay. trapped in a village with half-assed fortifications and they have to try to survive attacks. There you uh, go. <laughs> There's a few ways you can make that interesting. I'm, I, but I can't. Oh, yeah. You can yeah, you can open that story up with them trying to plug in a hole while, like, claws are trying to dig in and all that other stuff. Yeah, plug absolutely. In, that would be... Yeah, yeah. yeah open... Yeah, that's a... That's a so if you want to open a book up in the middle of an action scene or not is is always up for debate, but for that, absolutely do it that way. Oh yeah, by the uh, way, obligatory aliens reference. Come on, man. You gotta do it. <laughs> Coming out of walls. Uh, <laughs> um okay, so there's one book series. I don't wanna give myself away for it, um, because you guys are gonna know my reading preference, but in this world, it's a dystopia, and in that book, it started off with them talking about how hungry they were because they weren't able to find food in one of the towns that they were going through. So that's a danger thing because they're all fucking hungry, right? Ah, cannibalism. Mm-hmm. Who's going to get eaten? Uh, let's see. Ah, uh, my, uh, well, no, he's not my favorite example. I would actually, uh, I have such mixed feelings about, um, about this book, not just because of the author's name, but Stormbringer by uh, Michael Moorcock. He, uh, he, he has like such a fantastic story, but because he does so much telling in it, I'm like flopping on the floor of my office being like, please end it now for me. But because the world building that he's got in there is so intriguing, I'm like, I just have to find out what this thing is and then I'm going to stop listening. Then I ended up finishing it. I did it to myself, y'all. Um, uh, scroll, scroll, scroll. I have not read that book. Uh, Vampire Hunter D, actually. It's a, it's a Japanese written story that was translated in English, and that's a really good dystopia story, um, where we follow the damp here as he's going through, like, this just destroyed world and all the funness that goes in there. And there's definitely some moments where I'm like, oh, I don't think you're going to make it. And it's like, wait, you have to make it because you've got six more books. Uh, let's see. Yeah, isn't that isn't that weird? Like you know, the fourth wall kind of breaks the story a little bit. I hate when that happens, but there's really no way around it. I've been trying to find that example you just named of the fourth wall ruining the story. I've been trying to find like an example of that, and you just found it for me. I've been trying yeah. to find ways to prevent that. Like, yeah, I like the way to describe that and to prevent it. I don't think there is a way to prevent that, like at all. Yeah, and like <laughs> you, you know, I talked earlier about. Life. Yeah, yeah, and that's always that's always the risk that you run when you start a new book series, like brand new, like you're not like it's not coming out as you're reading it, like you you're catching up kind of thing. So like Jim Butcher with his Harry Dresden books, you know, he's he's on book 20, right? So if you start book 1 and you're reading the tension thing, like kind of like that suspense might be taken away a little bit just because you know he's got 19 more books afterwards. Oh, um man, but this thing is a book too. Guys. Yeah. Um, but no, Jim Butcher does a really good job of kind of talking about the immersion and the threat at the time it's happening um, to the point where there was definitely periods where I, I kept forgetting that there was more books after it. Oh, here's a really good one. Um, they made it a movie or a TV show. I'm not sure. It went, it went to the screen. Um, but it's called Warm Bodies by Isaac Maron. And that's so good. I really love it. It's from the point of view of a zombie that kind of falls in love with like a human girl. And he's trying to keep her alive away from the other selfies. <laughs> oh, it's so good. I really liked it a lot. Uh, let's see. There's a... No, that's... 
So now you see me by Chris. That's a book that actually opens up with a murder scene. Uh, let's see. I'm just going through my Kindle. I really appreciate your guys' patience while I do this. Uh, let's see. Yo, Ritter, spoilers. That is funny, though, but spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> he ate her boyfriend. Oh, yeah, that's right. I remember. You're absolutely correct. Uh, let's see. I have mixed thoughts on Nevernight, but that book definitely had some fun moments where they were like going through like tension scenes. So if you're looking for ways to depict tension, that's really good. But Nevernight is kind of like, I guess if you want to read about like murder Hogwarts, um, that's the place to go. Uh, let's see. I'm not going to recommend my own book. Uh, man, that is a fucked up plot point, man. <laughs> like, how do we root for this guy yeah. after that? <laughs> Well, it you know, if it makes you feel any better, he felt really bad about it. <laughs> that no, it doesn't. How, you don't apologize for that. <laughs> he was like, "Oh, I ate her boyfriend." Ugh. Feel really bad. Dude, uh, I'm sorry. Oh, it's so good. Can we? I want to do that. You know what? My guy that I do the uh, book thing with, I'm gonna make him read that book with me. That's my next book. Oh. Um. Oh, here's a good book that's not action, action, but you're talking about suspense and stuff like that. So it's called Reincarnation Blues by Michael Poor. Um, and that's it's a really good book. I, I really liked his um depiction about reincarnation and what happens to the soul for it to reach Nirvana. It was really, really good. I, so let's see. I'm only recommending you guys the best of the best as I keep scrolling through like my expansive uh, library. Uh, no, that's okay. Well, yeah, this is the question so a... period here. Like, how long are you going to do the questions, by the way? Not that I'm, uh, I'm you know, here I'll... for this to end or anything. What, you trying to kick, you all see that? He trying to kick me out. He like, no, it's nice I'm that not. you're here, but go home. Uh-huh. Yeah, he like, get already. out. <laughs> get out, get out of my house. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I will be happy to linger for another 30 minutes. Um, at the most if anybody wants to ask different questions or anything else like that but that's actually the end of my book recommendations related to that question did you want them both up here or one at a time oh you you bring up whoever you want it's fine i'll go back to the question slide for the sake of your recording though um hello okay i'm ready hello yes hello um so I was about to say it's Alexa. Um, so yeah, um, long story cut short, um, I did have like three rapid fire questions I just want to get out there. They're not fully pertaining to this, but they are pertaining to what you said earlier. Um, mm -hmm. You mentioned something about the limit of, of like K in books for like YA. So my question for that though is my book is kind of like an E10 kind of rated book because it's kind of like it has fantasy elements, some fantasy violence, um, but it's all kind of like, you know, old era Saturday morning cartoons. Oh, kind of stuff. I see what I think so, I know the question. So I'm trying to figure out like what's the like, you know, the the level of words I should have for that. So that way I can know how to edit or how to like set up things in the in the outlines I make. You mean like middle grade? Is that what you mean? I, I'm not really it's like I'm trying to do like I said, Harry Potter style. So I'm trying to balance it between like it's good enough that like if you're in like fifth grade you could probably get your hands on it, or fourth grade, you might almost get your hands on it, but sixth, seventh, eighth, maybe even ninth and tenth. Might so that's a it. bit, uh, yeah, that's middle grade. So it is, all right, so it is middle grade. Okay, yeah. so it's five to grade. Five to eight is middle school, yeah. Um. So, okay, so one thing that I will tell you, um, and this is if you want to get traditionally published, if you want to get self-published, then you write that book as much as you want to to write it, and, okay. and don't look back. Just just go with your, your hair blowing in the wind kind of thing. But when you're looking at working with traditional publishers, they like books to be within a certain range. And part of why they like that to be in a certain range is because of uh, that just tends to be how long the books are. Now, I'm going to caveat that with uh, J.K. Rowling actually made it really clear that young adult people don't need books that are only 100 page. They'll be willing to read books that are like, you know, all the way up to like uh, the Half-Blood Prince size, right? Um, and they'll do it because it's a story that they're really engaged in. Now, one thing I will also add to that is that J.K. Rowling, at the time when she wrote that book, she was already established. She had an avid readership and a fan base that was willing to gobble up anything that she wrote, right? Um, mm -hmm. So she had a little bit more leniency. And you'll actually notice that if you go through um, traditionally published authors, that their first book is kind of condensed. 
And then as they have uh, a more active fan base, then they're pretty much allowed to do whatever they want. Uh, Stephen King did that. J.K. Rowling did that. Uh, Jim uh, Jim Butcher did that. Uh, Brandon Sanderson did that. Like, I, I could name a whole bunch of people. Um, so I would kind of take a look and see what the range of your genre is. And if it's not going to fit in that range, be ready to explain to your book agent or to the publisher about why you're breaking the rules. Um, and the reason I'm going to tell you that is because... You can always break the rules if you do it really well. Okay. And um, that range is... Don't laugh, Ritter. No, that was me. I was I was doing an evil laugh. Because no, no, I, I know Ritter's evil. laughing. I know Ritter's laughing on the inside. Like, Wait, Ritter's hello? Laughing on the inside. I can hear it. Yeah, I can hear him laughing on the inside. Anyway, long story I wasn't short, laughing at all. Range, like you said, was what? Was what again? I just missed that last part. You said that range, though, as far as, like, it was... I know it was, like, she, like you could get kids to read, like, past 100 pages. Trust me, I was... In fifth grade, I was reading books that were around the size of the Half-Blood Prince. Only because mm -hmm. I was interested to see where the story went. But um, just for, like, the typical, like, late elementary to middle school reader, what would be, like, the recommended, like, word count? Mm -hmm. I can balance... Oh. I can probably balance it if I know what I'm kind of working within the um, scope of. That is a like really said, good... Mine is, mine is pretty much a high fantasy kind of world where kids are out of school, they have to fight off against an evil, and um, it's like they don't have to fight against the evil right that moment, but everybody's just kind of like meeting and greeting each other and fighting off against like the first enemy that they have to come across in order to kind of like graduate to kind of like really deal with the island's like whole thing and my goal with that though is i'm trying to keep everything within like the like maybe around 20 chapters limit and maybe a little maybe a little bit more depending on how everything kind of paces itself but if there is like a limit to like you know pages or word count i kind of want to keep it in mind is what i was trying to get at Word count is what you're going to want to focus on because page count is going to depend on the formatter um, that the publishing house has or whatever formatter that you decide to use. And everybody does something slightly different. I would say for middle grade, um, aim for the 40K to 60K. And if you're going to go above that, then, you know, just be willing to kind of explain why. And again, kind of like I mentioned earlier, uh, stories that take place in high fantasy settings or anything else like that have a little bit more forgiveness. And but again, I'm gonna kind of circle back to if you can break the rules and do it really well, then people aren't gonna care too much. Or in the worst case, when you're going through that editing process with the house publisher or with your current editor, they I mean an editor's job is usually to kind of look at your work and figure out how to make it like kind of tight and concise, right? So if I if not that I'm saying that he would do that, but if Venom suddenly gave me a manuscript that was like a hundred and ten thousand words long my first thought is like how do i get that to 105,000 words long right like so i'm going to be looking about where to cut the fat at so to speak but if i read it and i don't see that there's anywhere to do that then there's nowhere to do that so so i have a question okay. and uh, and this is my last question sorry um uh -huh. you said you also do editing so how much do you charge and do you also do would you also be up for doing a middle school like a middle um, gray kind of like book editing? Um, I mean, that's something that we can talk about later if you really want to, but my Perfect. fees usually start at three Perfect. words or three cents a word, so. Three cents a word, three cents a word. Ooh, three cents a word. Let me try something. Yeah, that's your <laughs> Google calculator. Thank you again. Yeah, that You're is welcome. your word what count would... times the times the three. <laughs> yeah, Insane. point you zero convert, three. Yeah. There was a death question? Oh, I'm still here. Hi, how's it going? <laughs> okay. So. I have some reservations about that math, but whatever. <laughs> it might not be that, but. When you, when you were talking about, uh, um, give, give a brief description in the comment tab over here about about your character and stuff or or however long you want it want it to be um i couldn't really do that because i'm not really sold on how my character is set up right now mm, and okay, so, 
and I and I'm still and I'm like I was and then I and then I wasn't. I was just like I keep going back and forth with that how, how how do you how do you deal with that just finally going screw it this is how the character is going to be um so that sounds like a character workshop session so that's something that i would actually encourage you to do with your writing group and say this is my character this is what i think their agency is and just let them ask you questions at that point um when you kind of get to like where i am um that's not really kind of like a workshop period so to speak that's just when i'm going to be looking at your character and see if it fits the story and if not then i'll be kind of addressing where it's not working and maybe provide some suggestions about how to move forward uh i would uh, an easy thing that you might be able to do is kind of uh get like a compilation of characters that are like your character but not quite and kind of review and study them and see uh, what their pros and cons are and how that applies to your character. Yeah. So, the I'm kind of basing my character off of one of my favorite comic book characters called Cassandra Kane. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're very similar in, in like, the type of struggles that they, that they go through and stuff like that. But mine's a bit darker. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. No, I would. Uh, I would workshop that with your friends and and kind of get their feedback and let them. Uh, kind of, I call it a spaghetti at the wall uh, sessions at that point where you guys just throw stuff at the wall mm -hmm. and see what sticks or works or doesn't work. Honestly, Ritter, you have a lot of details for your main character that I think you. I think you have, um, a basis for who they are. I just don't think you see it because you have a lot of details there. And we can just, like I said, we can discuss that offline. I think you already have a complete character that is perfectly flawed, and uh, there's plenty of room for development and growth. They're pretty self-aware, yada yada. I, I think my problem I is you're I selling keep yourself short here, honestly. I I keep I keep forgetting what I what I was gonna write, and then I look back at my outline, which I should probably keep doing. <laughs> and I'll be go. like, oh, I forgot to put that in there. What was the equation you used for the fuck? What was the equation you used for that? Oh, I did I did the math for you. It's three cents a word, not thirty cents a word. Yeah, so yeah, I, there just, we, yep. I just put it in there. Yeah. Yeah, there we go. All right. Okay, I'm ready to answer Ben's question. Wow, I wonder what my question is. Okay, yeah, I simple. What did I miss? Just What? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean I missed the whole thing. So like what other questions do I have? Like and I don't know, but that's not a question. Don't do that, answer, Ben. This entire thing was recorded. Well, I mean, I guess under like a couple minutes or so, I'll, I'll read the slides afterwards, but like maybe like give me a brief like uh, overview, perhaps. Oh, no, absolutely not. My brief overview took 30 minutes. Oh, okay. I'll, well. I'll, I'll, tell, I'll tell him. It, it was, it was, a, sure? it was a lecture involving how to edit. She covered the different types of editing. And what you can do by yourself to develop your own style of editing before actually taking your manuscript to a uh, a professional editor, if you need to, which I'm pretty sure she's dead set on. Even if you don't think you need to, you need to. So you need to. You know, at least get like a different set of eyes on it, because that one opening quote that I gave you guys about like people with English degrees saying that they don't need to have an editor, like it's no, and um, I'm not really saying that because I'm like trying to like promote like my own editing services or anything else like that. But like part of the reason that you really do need an editor is because you need somebody who's not in your head to look at your story and kind of see Bingo. it. Um, yeah, you, you need them to do that. Um, that was actually, I keep picking on you, Venom. I'm so sorry. Um, but one of the, there was a couple times in Venom's manuscript when I was reading it and on the side in the comment section, I was like, this is such a freaking epic moment inside your head that didn't make it to the page, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. And so when Venom and I would sit down when we would workshop it, I was like, explain to me what's happening here. And then let's, let's figure out how to make it actually show on the page, right? And that's, that's one of the big problems that we have when we're so deep and immersed in our own story is that because we are able to fill in those blanks and, you know, know the context behind certain moments that we, we oh, just you take made me a monster now. Hey, you, you made well, me no, a fucking did... monster now. <laughs> I'm, really... I'm not, I'm not trying to, but I mean, I did it with my own book too. I was, 
When Mommy, I you made me better at doing that. Like I'm, dude, I'm, oh. I'm straight now. I'm. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, you straight now? What were you before? Shut up. No, <laughs> <laughs> um, but that that's really one of the big things that um, an editor can do outside of making sure that your your writing is clear and easy to follow. Um, they can take a look at your story and make sure that it actually um, makes the sense that you want it to make. And there's definitely been times where. Um, you know, I've had an editor that would highlight like a passage in my story and they were, they said the same thing to me. It's like, I think this makes a lot more sense to you than it does to me. And then I would go read it and be like, yeah, from an outsider point of view, you're not going to get that. So I would have to go and clarify all that. Right. Oh, and my equation was right. It was just, yeah, he did 30 sentences. Mm -hmm. I, I often do do that thing too, where I have something in my head and, uh, and then I'll be writing to be like, wait a minute, wasn't I supposed to write something there? It didn't make it to the page. Oh no, that's no good. Oh no, that's a different that's a different problem than what she's describing. Um, you're describing, you know, the feeling that something is missing because you've forgotten what you're supposed to write. And what she means is, when we write like, something about a scene, it makes perfect sense to us. But when someone else reads it, they don't know what the fuck is going on because it's like <laughs> sitting behind a tall person. Oh yeah, movie. sorry. I was trying. I was trying to to say that. My my brain cells skipped leg day. <laughs> wow, that was a <laughs> I'm stealing that. That was a good way of putting that. <laughs> oh goodness. Um. Okay. So Monkey Coon wrote. So I'm not sure about an MC I have in the Demon Invasion story. She is relatively good person and all, but outside of her being self centered. Okay. Um, and having some selfish desires, I haven't really given her any other fault. Well, I mean, if you're talking about being self-centered, that's that's a pretty big fault. Um, so when we're, we're, we're talking about somebody who's self-centered, they usually, um, the way that they engage with people is going to reflect on that too. Uh, I usually tell folks when they're trying to write about love that love is an extremely selfish emotion because... When somebody's in love with another person, they're not really like, you know, checking in and being like, hey, do you love me too? It's kind of like, I love you and I want you to love me back, right? Um, same thing when we're talking about self-centered people because it's like they have main character syndrome, right? Like I'm the main character of everything that's going on and you are all here to serve me, so to speak. Um, I'm taking it to a little bit of an nth degree there just as an example. Um I don't really have to give her any fault that is good enough. I, I mean, when we're talking about flaws and faults and stuff like that, characteristics, quirks, you know, I talked earlier about how I'm a nail biter, right? Uh, you know, kids can be nail biters too, or they could be particular about how they have their room set up. The setting that you're kind of describing there, are very chaotic. And I know folks that are in a very chaotic, uncertain situations try to exhibit control in different ways because they, they're trying to have a say in something. They're trying to have influence. And uh, when I used to be a teacher, one of, uh, unfortunately, the dead giveaways that a child was coming from a troubled home is that they were always very particular about how their desk was going to be arranged. Pins would be in a certain place. Stuff inside their desk cubby would be in a certain place. And if you touched it, they had a tantrum. And a lot of individuals would immediately try to diagnose those children of, as having OCD syndrome. But what they were really trying to do was exhibit some kind of control in their current environment. So that way they had some kind of stability. So um, you could play with that a little bit um, in your story. Um, not just with that particular character, but you can do that with anybody else that might be in this village as well. Uh, what is a good way to depict death in a middle grade story? Oh, that's... um. So that kind of depends. Uh, a lot of times they kind of like to do like death off scene. Um, I'm going to pick on uh, Gundam Wing again um, because instead of saying the word, you know, instead of saying the S word in there, they like to say uh, self deletion in there instead. Um, so when I was reading middle grade, Tamora Pierce, if you guys want to go and dive into another author that's well known for that genre. Tamara Pierce writes a lot of middle grade books, and when she talks about the death, she doesn't really talk about like the gory details of it, or she kind of skims over it. So in one book, uh -huh. there was a plague that happened, and it kind of talked about how people got sick, but you didn't really get to be in the room with the sick people, so to speak. You got to you got to kind of hear about it from a distance. 
in the one instance when there was um, a, a death scene, that was kind of the story climax. And it wasn't, again, talked about with like any uh, glorifying details on the violence or the, the death itself. You know, it's it's kind of like the opposite of Berserk that way. Um, so it's, it really has to do with like how you depict it. Now, if you write a middle grade book and you talk about how this guy ran his sword through somebody's belly and then like go into a lot of detail about how like the guts fell out of him and onto the ground as your editor for a middle grade book, I'd be like, not quite the place. Exactly. Okay, so this is... All right, so... Um... I have to tell who is it who did that? Venom? That was you that mm -hmm. asked that question, right? Which mm -hmm. one? Oh yeah, I did. I okay. did it for you. <laughs> yeah. Oh, see, thank you, Venom. See, I I almost want to blame you like Ritter sometimes, but it's times like this that make me just wanna give you a hug instead of pulling off my weave, these earrings and these heels, and just, you know, going to town or something. Uh, he... But yeah, um long story cut short though, um, yeah, I just wanted to I uh, just want to note one thing though because um I was asking Venom that same question once upon a time because mm -hmm. um I think out of everybody here I'm pretty much the only person who might be writing a kids book. Mm -hmm. So because I'm trying well kids are you know tween teen book. So because I'm working with like a certain limited like visor so to speak or pathway so so to speak there are elements of things that happen and it's like, I know we were talking and we said, you know, you could either A, allude to something, and then it's like, you know, you can kind of cut away from the scene and transition to another scene, or B, you could hint that something had happened and you leave it to the reader's imagination. Kind of like um, I was talking to him about the bestiary, where it's like I have creatures that are made out of dark energy and they usually like wear like discarded clothes mm -hmm. and objects. And in certain cases, they could be seen wearing, like, the return pins that students have, which each, mm -hmm. each student needs in order to get back into the academy. So there's mm -hmm. kind of like this hint that, you know, if you see one with it, pretty much, you know, a student, they probably, if you see a creature with this, it's obviously enough that probably a student, a student had dropped it on their way back to school. Without question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They dropped it on their way back to school. Dot, mm -hmm. dot, dot. But yeah, it's like, yeah. Um, yeah, it's like, it's, I asked him this because I had mentioned Harry Potter to him and I told him that, you know, technically J.K. Rawlings had done a very impressive um, ability when she had done the first three books, that everything was all, quote, left to the imagination, or it was fantastic enough that you didn't really, like, get to see it, or when you did see it, it was like, it was a monster, like, the basilisk is killed. Um, mm -hmm. because of, you know, the, 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 the fang or whatnot, and the, um, and Tom Riddle is killed because the book was stabbed, not the ghost, or how, you know, what's his name, Oliver, like, dies in this ghastly grimace of dark magic, and we never see what really happens to him, or, like, in the third book, Sirius Black is, like, you know, it's, like, it's suggested that he's gonna die unless Hermione goes back in time, or that the mm -hmm. hippogriff dies because his head is cut off. Yeah, like, suggested, <laughs> but by the, but by the fourth book, but by the fourth book, it's like we get our first death in the Goblet of Fire when, like, Cedric um, gets shot with the Avada Kedavra spell. And it's like he oh just God, dies. Spoilers. Yeah, and it's like, like <laughs> <right now>? what? <laughs> yeah, no, that's always my joke. Like, when I talk about Moby Dick, Moby Dick and everybody's like, oh, my God, spoilers. Oh, it's been out forever. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, so, it, it, no, yeah, so in that case, when you actually saw, like, the actual death scene, like, the one thing that I want to point out is that when that happened in the fourth book of the series, like, think about how impactful that was, right? That was, that was a, a, a passing of innocence moment, right? Harry watched somebody that he knew die, and it changed him, right? And you can literally see a change in his behavior from before that book and after that book. It was something that usually lingered with him in some shape or form. Um, now, fantastic example. Yeah. I'm going to... I'm going to throw you um, a couple other references that you can kind of um, percolate on. That's my favorite word I like to use for these moments. Um, so I'm going to circle back to Tamora Pierce. And the reason I want to circle back to Tamora Pierce when we're talking about depictions of violence in middle grade books is because she writes about a medieval time with lots of fighting in it, right? So she's got lots of examples in there. Um, Two of the book series that she's got in there, they kind of take place in the same universe, but one is called um, 
Let's see. One is called Wild Magic, and it's a story about a girl who has a special relationship with animals and how it helps her. And then the other one that I would recommend, and this one has a lot more um, kind of grit to it. Um, this is a book that pl takes place 100 years before her main book series, but it's called uh, Becca Cooper Terrier. And it's the story of um, kind of like a, a medieval police officer's, like her first year on the force, so to speak. So obviously she's got like lots of action that's going on in there and lots of things that she's got to do to bad people. And uh, she actually has a phrase in there I really love. It's called the nap tap. Um, and it's called the nap tap because what do they do? They hit the back of the head to knock people out, right? Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so Becca Cooper by Tamora Pierce, first book, Terrier. I would recommend that if you're looking for ways to kind of um, describe violence without it being too gory. Uh, and then kind of see how that fits into your current work right now. Okay. Because, um, yeah, no, I, like, um, like that was one thing I was trying to work on. It was the elements of, quote, death in my book. Because the book is themed like an RPG. Well, it has RPG-like elements. Mm -hmm. So it's like monsters, they kind of do that whole kind of like Digimon thing. Where it's like, you know, they all kind of like fade into green energy and it all returns back to the situational. But then you do have students who are allegedly known to have disappeared or are no longer there. And I try to, like, not push the boundaries on it. Mm -hmm. But I do want to, like... Oh, sure, sure, sure. <laughs> okay, so, one, Pokemon has a terrible bestiary. Oh, no, I'm so sorry. I'm thinking about Digimon. My mistake. I'm sorry. Uh, I'll stick about Digimon. Well, um, I, I did come up with a new name for um, the manga bestiary for like um, the reincarnated Demon King just wants to go home. And I just mm. came up with this name for Ganku Monkeys, which is pretty much like monkeys that literally look like half Son Goku and half Genghis Khan kind of like approach. Fucking love that. They're, I they're love like, that so much. They're pretty much, they're pretty much barbaric and they're just like insane. But the joke is I'm also taking this in Goku period as well. So you literally have a mountainside of monkeys that make up three factions. One is literally the faction of enlightenment, and they and it's like one joke is that the main character, like literally meets the strongest one there, and the dude literally like Buddha drops him from the heavens, and like it would look like he would destroy half the world with what he does, but it's 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 a whole story for another day. But it's like I am thinking of trying to work on names, like if there was a bestiary like name builder i could work with i would love to find one because even though i've given names like crescent bears glibbies and um like you know um um verdian pelt wolves it, it's like it, it's like certain things a part of me is like they do feel kind of repetitive and i do want to kind of like i do with character designs i do want to kind of mention something that kind of brings to like what the character like you know does also monkey con i got the buddha drop reference from um what's his name i don't know if anybody remembers a game called ashura's wrath but like the first boss literally does the whole kind of like weird yeah, yeah like like the whole god finger thing like in the second battle but in the first battle he becomes like that huge like fat deity of like divine wisdom but he's totally not and he's just like dropping his body everywhere and nuking the entire environment and it's so beautiful but yeah um but yeah no no, no it is like also, one it of is the faction where they have the, the dumbest one as the leader and they just like we let him think he's the leader <laughs> well honestly that is rpg academy's like funny trope is that melvin is technically the real leader of the group like venom knows his backstory to like the drafted degree and it's really good mm -hmm. as far as the yeah, but Al, I'm um, sorry, but Artie is what Artie is what I like to call the kind of like dumb, sweet, honest kid. No, no, Artie too is like I really worked hard on Artie, but Artie is the dumb, sweet, like wild child kid who just literally is like this. Don't worry, guys, I've got this. Five minutes later, how did you unleash an elder dragon that literally <laughs> locked away in the other area? Oh, 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 he's just an That's idiot. That's great, he's, I love that. He's, 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 he's like that lovable dog that you know is just dumb. And it's like, you think to yourself, it's like, you love him, you care for him, but you throw a stick and he comes back with a tree. And you have to pay like $10,000 to damage him. <laughs> oh, 
Oh, the, the it's, ultimate, it's the ultimate Goku. I love it. Um, it's, I'm gonna answer two questions. More. Well, sorry, 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 sorry. Let me get, let me get yeah. out, let me get out. But thank you again, Miss Carol. You're welcome. Um, so the two questions, any naming convention help? I cannot help you because I'm the kind of author that when I need to name something, I'm going to look around my desk and be like, this is the land of Chipolia, right? Because that that's just what's on my desk. Um, and I'll, yeah, no, I, I am really the worst person to ask about names. When I have to pick a character name, I'll go to the name generator and just flip through one until one like catches my eye. And then I ask myself the really important question that comes after that, which is, can I pronounce it? If I can't pronounce it, I'm going to pick another one.